guys, welcome to the Vertical Life Church online experience. I'm Kelly and I'm so excited to welcome you to our global community. We want to awaken and empower you in your walk with Jesus. And so we're gonna bring you some powerful worship and an awesome message. Check it out. We're just gonna sing of your sovereignty. We're gonna sing of your goodness. We're gonna sing of what happens in your presence. God, and we're just so excited that we get to do it with one another and to you and with you this morning. So let the song of the redeemed come forth through this place. Let it permeate these walls as we sing it even over our city. That you reign, that you reign forever and ever, amen. Let's worship, guys. Well, it's the song of the redeemed rising from the African plain. Oh, it's the song of the forgiven drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers filled with God's holy fire. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation love song born of a grateful choir. Let's sing it out. All God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, He reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, He reigns. We sing it out. It's all 
can't drown out a single word. Our praise will go forth this morning. Come on, church. In all the powers of darkness, they tremble at what they just heard. Let your 
generation to generation. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can stand against our God? Therefore, with boldness, we come before the Lamb of God to worship, to bow down. With gratefulness in our hearts, we come before you, Jesus. We're so humbled, so in awe of your power and your beauty and your ability, of your love and your kindness and your faithfulness. We just sing of who you are and what you do. Your praise is in our hearts this morning, Jesus. Nothing matters more than just 
begin to tell him of his worth, begin to tell him of his worth and who he is. We crown you this morning. It's all for you this morning, King of glory. It's all for you this morning, King of glory. We are here for one purpose, one reason, and that is to make much of him this morning. So with your mouths,
strong words. Ooh. Those are strong words when we invite his government into our lives. But it's his rule, it's his kingdom and his way. He says he's the way, the truth, and the life, and there is none outside of him. So we say, it's your rule, your way.
turning back No turning back No turning back No turning back No turning back You know, as we sing that song, I'm just reminded of Youth Camp, which is actually getting ready to come up. But just can we approach God with that same childlike surrender we had then? God asks us not to be childish, which we can be that sometimes, but He asks us to be childlike. And all kinds of stuff gets in the way the older we get, the cares of this world. And I believe that's one of the reasons He asks us to be childlike put our soul, trust, faith, everything in Him. So we're going to sing I Have Decided one more time. And I just approach it with a child likeness. Connect your heart with it. Let's re-pledge our allegiance, re-pledge our lives to Him this morning. A fresh surrender, a new mercy, a clean slate because of the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Just another minute or two. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. We're so glad to have you as a part of our online family today. We couldn't put on this experience without your generosity and support. If you'd like to partner with us as we continue to spread the gospel, there are two ways that you can give at Vertical Life. You can text any amount to 84321, or you can go to verticallife.info and click give. We believe that God has something awesome to teach us today, so let's prepare our hearts as we continue in our service with an awesome message. In this next season here as a church, you know, for the next series, I want to talk about one of, one of my things in a, a, a passion in my heart is building a resilient, mature people. Amen. Would you say amen to that? Not just resilient uh, uh, church, but we're only a resilient church if we have resilient parents, fathers, mothers, resilient individuals and families. And I would argue that a church is only as strong as its families are. And so what I, I really want to emphasize, you know, even in this, this season, we were emphasizing, you know, just training and equipping and empowering the family unit. And for you individuals who are looking for a family one day to be married and have your own, don't, don't, don't dismiss this information. You need it for your own life for when you have your own family. And so right now, though, there's a, there's a concern that I have just kind of watching the nation and seeing what's happening it's extremely deep, like, like deeply concerning to me. It seems like the further the, our nation drifts away from God, the more confused and unstable it becomes. Would you agree with me? Like something is shifting here. And what I don't want to see is the church shifting with it. You know, in 2007, I think it was 2007, a political leader um, over our nation made a statement. He said that we are no longer a Christian nation. It's powerful words. Think about that. An authority in our nation made a statement that we are no longer a Christian nation. And notice what's been happening from, you could argue even from that moment forward, it just seems like we're drifting away and the more unstable and chaotic and confused the world or our nation is, is becoming. And I was listening to this pastor, these pastors on this podcast, they were talking back and forth, and they're 
interviewing each other. And uh, one of the things that he said that really stood out to me, and he was referring to the parable. Hey, is there, there's feedback coming up here. Can we fix that? Um, there, was, there was a parable um, where he was talking about when you cast out a devil from an individual. Yes, there's demons. And when you, when you perform deliverance on someone, you remove a, a, a demon, what he does is he, he leaves and he wanders around. Have you heard that? You read that parable that, that, where he's describing what's taking place. He says it wanders around and it finds no place to rest or call home. And so what it does, it does what? It returns back, right? And when it returns back, it finds that, hey, it's empty in an order, but it's empty. And so what it does is it goes back and gets what? Seven more, right? And what does it do next? Come back, and the condition of the latter state is what? Then the first state. And then we usually stop there, but then Jesus, and this is what this pastor emphasized, Jesus read the, uh, he, at the last sentence, he says, so it is with this generation. And he said there's a principle here that we want to apply that just to individuals and not realize that you can take that principle and apply it to generations and nations. And then he went on to say, look at what happened to Israel. You know, the moment that they walked away from God and got evil kings, what happened? Their latter state was always worse than their original state, right? Then he went on to say about Germany. Germany was a Christian nation. Walked away from God. And then we know, all know the horrible stories of what happened with Hitler. And then he said, well, look at what ha is happening here with America right now. That what we're doing, we were a Christian nation, is we're walking away from God. Maybe you're not, but as government officials and different things like that begin to walk away from God, you can see what's happening in our nation, and I pray that doesn't happen, but it's like our, our latter state is going to be worse than the beginning. And what we need to be as Christians and followers of Jesus is to be resilient, to have clarity, and to have conviction, right? Yeah. Well, you need to know what you believe. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put up this picture, it may offend some of you, but I really don't care. And so there's, this, there's an agenda happening in our nation right now, trying to redefine truth. Like, as a father, I'm concerned that if my daughter was the best in her sport, she could lose her position to a guy that's confused of who he is. As a father, you should be concerned. You should be concerned when you read about a 15-year-old girl in Oklahoma getting beat up in the bathroom by a transitioning man. That should offend you, church. It should upset you. It should bother you. It should never be okay. And this is the concern of what tends to happen within the church is first we're mad, but then we become fearful. Fear of losing friends, fear of losing our job, fear of losing our security, fear of speaking out, and then what happens is we accept it. We go from being mad to being fearful to accepting it. You know, we shouldn't be surprised by what's happening because even Jesus said, look at this passage here, Matthew chapter 13, verse 20, uh, 29. There's a whole section there. But he says, but he said, no, let, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And so what we can see here is that evil and righteousness will reach its full maturity at the same time. Growing together. What's sobering to me is, which are you? Are you the wheat? Or are you the weeds? And how do you know? You don't want to find out on the day of harvesting. Who are you? What are you standing for? You know, I, I read this author, and he was saying how, how silence in times of evil is evil in itself. 
I can't sit back and lead a church with a whole clean heart before God and not speak out against things that's going to destroy your family, destroy your marriage, destroy your, your children, and destroy the next generation. I can't sit back. The church is drifting with it. I mean, you hear major pastors affirming things that God is against. People twisting the scripture to say whatever they want to say. Why? I think what we have done is that we have made, we have taken the presence of God and the word of God from being at the center of the church and we removed it and placed at the center of the church the, uh, the presence of man and the praise and approval of man, their opinion. You know, in the tabernacle, I don't know if you understand or spent much time studying the Old Testament, but there was a tabernacle and at the presence of the tabernacle was what? The, the presence of God, right? At the center of it was the presence of God, right? What was sacrificed for the presence of God? Flesh. In today's church, at the center of the church, the Western church, is the presence of man and what is sacrificed, the, pres the spirit, his word. And I want to see the word of God and the presence of God return to the center of the church and not only the church, but in your life, in your family, and in your marriage. And I cannot be silent about it. I say some of these, th these things wondering if one day I'm actually going to be in prison. This is not messages, messages that you preach to build a church in the sense of numbers. This actually thins a church. But I want to see a resilient, strong, mature, stable church. Amen. Amen. I want to look at two passages here. The first one is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16, which is a staple within this church. You'll see actually one of the signs out in the foyer. But Paul is writing here, and he says this, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to what? Everyone say it. Mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that, so doing all these things, so that we may no longer be what? Come on, what? Children. Children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and in deceitful schemes. So he's defining a child as what? Someone who's unstable, tossed to and fro, easily deceived, moving with every, every opinion. Well, yeah, but the news said this. Yeah, but science and research said this. You're, you're constantly moving all the time. He's defining you. If you're unstable and constantly moving in your opinions, he's saying that you're an infantile in your faith. You're an infant. That spiritual maturity is I am unmovable because I'm rooted and anchored in the word of God which doesn't move. And he goes on here. He says, rather speaking the what? The truth in love, we are to what? Grow up. Everyone say, it's time to grow up. It's time to put your big boy pants on. And not just sit around and, and hope that things will get better. I told you before, I'll tell you again, hope is not a strategy. we got to take action in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Once again here, Paul is defining spiritual maturity in one way as being stable and unmovable by the opinions of man and by 
the doctrines of man and by schemes and strategies. And if you don't wake up right now and open your eyes, you're going to drift right with it. There is a demonic scheme and strategy right now to redefine truth, to redefine what a family unit is, to redefine what even gender is. And if you're not careful, you'll move right along with it. Another verse I want to read here is Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through 14. Some people argue Paul also authored this letter. He says here about, about this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become, what? Dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. Just the basic things. We're back at it again. How did God define the marriage between a man and a woman? But we're back at it again. Here he is. I got to come back here and teach the basic principles and the oracles of God. He says, you need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is what? Unskilled in the word of righteousness. Since he is a child. But solid food is for the, what, mature, for those who have their powers of discernment, what, trained. Everyone say trained. 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 It doesn't just happen. You got to train it by constant practice to do what? Distinguish good from evil. So another characteristic of immaturity is the inability to distinguish between righteousness and wickedness, between evil and good. Are you able to tell the difference between what is right and what is wrong? Between evil and between wickedness. So not only is Paul saying that one form of maturity and what I, I want to see in our body is a, is a form of resilience, is being unmovable, but it's also that you have been trained to be able to quickly distinguish, hey, that's, not, that, that's evil, that's wicked. We need to return to black and white and get out of this area of gray. I mentioned it before, but I believe that the grayer your vision becomes on what is good and what is, what is evil, I believe you're walking away from God, not towards God. Think about it. Would you agree that God knows absolute truth? Would you agree that he's a holy God? Would you agree that he knows what is right and what is wrong? So if you, if you by your own admittance, he knows those things. So if you're, if you're go, going to him, then what should happen to your sight? Clear. Thank you. And if it's becoming grayer, then what's happening? You're walking away. The church has become too gray. And part of it, and, most, and I, I think a big reason of it is because of pastors compromising on truth and not drawing lines for its people. And I don't want to be those individuals standing before God. I entrusted this group to you, and you did not draw the lines where I drew the lines. Where I put periods, you put question marks causing them to question my basic truths. Proverbs 18, 13, or 8, 13 says, fear of the Lord is to hate evil. You can't say that you fear God and not hate evil. And what blows my mind, sorry, I'm not even jumping, like what blows my mind is how we can know what God hates and then just entertain ourselves with it. I was talking to a friend and we were talking about entertainment and how all of a sudden they said, hey, we're not going to watch this show anymore. Why? Because it introduced same-sex uh, relationship in there, sexuality and the act of it and so forth. And and, I, and my question is like, but how come you're okay with the heterosexual unmarried acts? 
Because there was a time in our nation that to even show that on TV was a big deal. And so slowly, maybe you were mad at it, but then you became fearful and then you accepted it. And it's normal. And now your understanding of what's okay to be entertained by has shifted. Oh, no, 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 I can't watch that. But you're okay with watching that. God hates both of that. It's sexual immorality. You have to have the ability to be able to discern between what is right and what is wrong. And we as believers need to become stable and resilient, unmovable, because once again, we have anchored ourselves in the Word of God. I keep saying the Word of God because that is what's going to bring stability and clarity in your life. The Word of God. Do you spend any time in it? Most Christians get their theology from their favorite worship song. And a lot of them are wrong. It's the word of God that's going to bring stability to your life. And it's the word of God that's going to bring clarity to your life. And see, that's, the, that's, the, that's where the issue is for a lot of people. Because all of us, we have some kind of operating system in our life that has trained us to decide what is good and what is evil. For some of you, maybe it's your upbringing. For some of you, maybe it's your emotions. Oh, I just feel like that's okay. What? <laughs> you felt like you were going to marry that individual too. You felt like that was the right thing to do by buying that car. Now you can't pay for it. You felt like it was okay to eat another cheesecake. What? <laughs> You're using your feelings to define what is right and wrong in your life? Are you serious? Your fears, your desires, all these things, we have an operating system and what happens is the word of God comes in and confronts that operating system in our life and we have a decision to make. Either we obey and change or we try to change his rules. You know, I love what Nicole was singing earlier, this little phrase, his rule, his reign, his way. His rule, his reign, his ray, way, his government in your life. You know that prayer, the Lord's prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your what? And what? Where? You know, we pray that, hey, your, 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 your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we want what's in heaven to be here. And what we need to understand is you're praying and inviting his government in your life. You can't have heaven without the, his government. You can't have his kingdom without his kingship and lordship in your life. And what's happened with a lot of Christians is there's a malfunctioning happening in your life because you're trying to follow God on a faulty operating system. Your own opinions, your own fears, your own values, your own wounds. And you're trying to follow Jesus and you're glitching. What is happening to me? Why do I feel this way? Because you have an operating system that needs to be renewed. And how is it renewed? By the word of God. Paul said, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. So then you can improve and know the will of God. You can't even know his will until you renew your mind with his word. And there's Christians in the body of Christ saying, that's not God, God would never do that. Says who? Your feelings and emotions and your daddy issues that you're portraying on God? Sorry, maybe I'm a little aggressive here, but listen, church, you better wake up. You better wake up. Because it's going to cost us our next generation. We need clarity as a church, conviction as a church, stability as a church. 
It begins with renewing our minds with the word of God. Notice here, Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Like when the word of God is put in front of you, it just opens you up and reveals who you are. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 5, Paul says, I charge you... In the presence of God in a Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, do what? Preach what? Not psychology, not self help, the word of God. To be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience. And teaching, and notice what he says. He says, for a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But because of their own itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You know how the devil's going to deceive you? Through your own desires. Because you'll chase your own desires and twist the word of God to fit them. And when you're around a ministry or church or leadership that rebukes you, you run and find someone else. That will affirm you. And agree with you. We better wake up. The only way the devil can deceive you is to get you away from the word of God. I think it was Mark Driscoll, he made a statement, when people have a theological problem, so you have an issue with the word or doctrine, it's usually the manifestation of a moral problem. That you want to twist the word of God. You have an issue with a certain concept because you actually have a moral problem with it. And so rather than changing and bringing your life into submission, you try to change the word of God. Happens all the time. What you do with the word of God will determine everything about your life. When you hear the word and it confronts an area in your life, what you do with it in that moment will determine everything about your life. And if you constantly choose to not submit your life to it, Paul warns us, I think it's in Thessalonians, that there's coming a day that a strong spirit of delusion will fall upon your life and you, will never, you won't even know the truth anymore. So constant compromise leads to a state of deception. And so when you see the word of God, your response has to be I, uh, obedience. Obedience is the only antidote for deception. Obedience to the word of God is the only antidote for deception. How many in here you say, hey, I don't want to be deceived? How many here say, hey, I want to be resilient? Hey, I want to be mature. I want to be stable. I want to be unmovable. That's me, anyone else. I, 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 that's what I want. I want to give you three things. I'm not saying these are all encompassing, but I'm going to give you three things that challenge you in those areas. The first one is this. You better count the cost. If you don't count the cost, you already lost. I know it rhymes, sounds like a Dr. Seuss thing or whatever, but if you do not count the cost, you have already lost because the reality is, is that you're gonna come up against something and be like, ah, I don't know, and then you're gonna give in. What is the cost? Your life. See, we don't wanna say that in the Western church. We just want to say, hey, if you follow Jesus, you can have everything. Your life will be better, easier. 
You have to count the cost. It's not going to be easy. And too many people, you're living, I'm here to tell you this, you're living with one foot in, in his kingdom, trying to follow him, and one foot in the kingdom of darkness, trying to be in it. You're in both places. It's time for you to make a decision. Either call him your king or just admit that you're following someone else. Make up your mind. You have to count the cost. It will cost you relationships. It's going to cost you acceptance. It may cost you your job. It could cost your kids being in these little sport leagues all over during the week. I'm, I'm sorry to inform you, but there's a pretty good, like 99.9% .9 chance your kid is not going to be a professional player. But what you're putting on the table and you're betting on is their legacy and where they spend eternity. And you're trying to tell them to follow God, but you played no emphasis in your life as a parent on following God. Oh, there's a soccer league thing on Sunday. Or you used to never be sports, kids' sports, on a Sunday. Notice how everything's shifting. Now it is. There's a demonic scheme happening, and it appears okay. It, it appears innocent, but it's not. And then when you're Teen, when your kid is now a teenager, 17, 18 years old, and you're wondering why they have no value for the house of God, no valuing, value for following Jesus, doesn't know the difference between right and wrong, I'm, look in the mirror. That's how you stewarded your child. You don't want to hear it. No one wants to hear this, Right? You didn't come in Sunday like, yeah, let's just get kicked in the punch in the face. This sounds great. Just punch me a couple of times. That wasn't hard enough, Jeremy. Do it again. Maybe I wish you hit that tree for real on that motorcycle, right? No one wants this. I get it, guys. I, no one wants this. It's the truth. And you got to hear it because something's brainwashing you right now. There's a scheme and a strategy to brainwash you. Saying that, oh, you don't even need to be gathered to be a part of the church. What? Paul warns about that in the Bible. He says there's going to come a day, a day where you're going to have to fight to even gather. People see no need for it. YouTube's been a blessing and a curse at the same time. You following some pastor on YouTube doesn't make you a church. You need someone to look you in the eyes and say, you're wrong. Here's the word of God. Count the cost. Rod Dreher makes a statement. Relatively few contemporary Christians are prepared to suffer for the faith because the therapeutic society that has formed them denies the purpose of suffering in the first place and the idea of bearing pain for the sake of truth seems ridiculous. The Western church, what we're experiencing is we realize that a case of spiritual atrophy. Everything has been easy for us. And now that there's some resistance, we're like, oh, no. We're freaking out. Listen, count the cost. As a shepherd in this church, I'm telling you, have a conversation with your spouse. Have a conversation with your kids. Do we want to follow Jesus or not? And if you don't, then quit playing around. Go do your own thing. But if you want to, count the cost and realize that that cost, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but Jesus made it very clear that unless you lay down your life, you will never find life. And you're trying to follow Jesus with an old operating system that says, I can have the, whatever I want and follow Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, I'm a king, and I share my throne with no one. I don't share my throne with your desires. I don't share my throne with your soccer league. I don't share my throne with your baseball league. I don't share my throne with your corporation. I don't th share my throne with your finances. I don't share my throne with your pretty little house. I don't share my throne with anything. I don't care about your American dream. I share my throne with no one. I'm here to establish a kingdom. The second thing is this, is love the word. You know, King David said this, I hide your word in my heart 
so that I would not sin against you. If you're not in the word, I wrote this, I'm trying to, there's a fine line between being proper as a preacher and just saying things. And, and you guys gave me permission. <laughs> if you're not consistently in the word, listen, you are ignorant. You are ignorant. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you have actually read the Bible from cover to cover? How many of you was how, how many of you have actually spent time in the Word of God, just learning it and studying it and knowing God's opinion? Do you have a reading plan that you're consistent see consistently in Scripture? I bet you have an eating plan: breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I bet you have a finance plan. I bet some of you you have a workout plan. You have an entertainment plan. Do you have a spiritual plan, spiritual discipline? You know, I was talking, we, were, we do a staff uh, chapel teaching on Mondays, and I was talking to them and talking about how, how do we respond to God's invitation to know him? Like, do you have a plan? I'm not talking about in the moment, but if we laid out your schedule next week, is there a plan to know him and to know his will and to know his way and spend time with him? Do you have a plan for everything else, but do you have a plan to know him? And one of the things that I was asking is like, you know how you say you're with your wife or your kids and you're just watching a show and for you or for them, that might be quality time, but for the other, other individual, like it's not quality time, right? Like what, I was around, what do you mean? I was there. That's not quality time. And so when it comes to God, my question is, is like you're giving him time, but does he count it as quality time? Is it actually quality time you're giving him? Or do you just give him the scraps? How do you prioritize your week next week? If we look out your calendar, what is your routine for the day? Does it say that I'm responding to an invitation to know him? Does it say that I value him? I have this carved out moment that I spend with God. Well, I just don't have time, Jeremy. I understand people have busy lives. I want to be compassionate to that. Unless you lose your life, you won't find it. You're prioritizing something in your life. Love the word. And I said it earlier, but I'll say it here. The way you love it is to obey the word. And obedience is the only antidote for deception. That's it only antidote is obedience the third one and the final one is this is stand for truth if no one knows your standards besides you then they're not standards Eric Metaxas makes a statement. We, we, repent, we, we pretend we would have spoken out for the Jews in Bonhoeffer's day or that we would have spoken against the slave trade in Wilberforce's day. But, we're, but are we speaking out today on the issues that are no less important to God in our time? If not, we're deceiving ourselves. You know, there's this, uh, I think it's in Deuteronomy, it talks about, I, I may have mentioned this before, but the laws of war. If a young man just got married, send him home. Don't send him to war. If a young man just planted a vineyard and he hasn't had the chance to eat from its harvest, then send him home. And then there's this other qualification that I always found interesting. And, it's, and if that young man is fearful in his heart, then send him home unless it gets into the heart of others. Fear is contagious. In fact, do you know that there's only two fears that you're born with? Two. Loud noises and falling. So baby, if you make a loud noise, it scares them. Or if you like, you kind of drop them, it scares them. I know, I didn't know how to say that. <laughs> 
falling and loud noises. Every other fear is learned. It's trained. And right now, what your children need, what everyone else in this church needs, what I need, is people who say, you know what, I will stand for truth. Silence is not a strategy right now. And it doesn't mean that we don't need an obnoxious church, we, we need a bold church. It's not, it doesn't mean you go out and just, you're just obnoxious. But when there's opportunities for, to stand for truth, you stand for truth. If you don't stand for truth right now, what makes you think you're going to do it later? Acts 4, 29 through 31 says this. And now, Lord, look upon what? Their threats. So it's very real. There's threats coming at them. And grant to your servants to what? Continue to speak what? The word. God's standard with all boldness. So there's an attempt to silence them from preaching and declaring the word of God. While you stretch out your hand and to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. That's what we need right there. We need to be praying for boldness and notice that miracles follow the bold. And what we need right now in this hour is a church that's not obnoxious, but a church that is bold and willing to, st I've counted the cost. I've counted the cost. And now I'm gonna stand for truth. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that today's service was an encouragement and a blessing to you. And we would love for you to share it with your friends and family. If you have any prayer requests, testimonies, or anything you'd like to share, send us an email at hello at verticallife.church or reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. We hope you guys have an awesome week. See you next time.